Good afternoon. Uh, pleasure to be here and really an honor for me to join you. I know you've all traveled very far and taken leave from very complex and busy assignments. So it's a pleasure to talk with you about some of the issues around African security. I am, although I've been an administrator for a long time, I'm also a political scientist by training. So I wanted to put Africa's security challenges first in the context of the bigger question, which is how are states built? And how traditionally have states extended their authority so that there is peace in the land? And what I'd say is in comparison to how other countries in Western Europe, in Asia, in South America have developed over time. There's not that much that is actually surprising in the security challenges that African countries face. New young countries, and of course most of your countries are a little more than 50 years old, traditionally face a lot of security problems because what is security at the end of the day? It is the willingness of the population to cede to the capital the right of self-protection. That people no longer say, I will protect myself and my family, but say, I will rely on the government, perhaps hundreds of miles away, to protect me. And that government has a monopoly, as we'd say in political science, on legitimate violence. That's a very hard thing for people to do because people around the world will do anything to protect themselves and their family. And they'll only give up that responsibility and give it to a government, give it to a military, give it to police, if they're assured, and this is, goes to Joe's central argument, that the government is well managed. <coughs> it takes a long time for this to happen. In the United States, of course, we fought a brutal civil war, which was notable for its bloodshed, given the um, military technology of the day, 85 years after our independence, okay? So that's longer than almost all the countries in this room have been independent. If you look at France, in 1850, more than half of the people in what is now territorially France did not speak French, not identified necessarily as French citizens. Over the century, or so that's occurred since then, Paris has tried to cajole, convince, coerce people to become Frenchmen and French women. And even the island countries, which you'd think would be more natural countries, England, Japan, have long brutal histories of division before a central authority is able to impose peace. There's no such thing as a natural country all countries are artificial creations, and they have to work hard to get their citizens to con be convinced that the government will protect them. What is unusual about Africa since independence for most countries in the early 1960s is that weak countries persist. If you look at the history of Europe, for instance, since 1500, the vast majority of states that existed disappeared. They were weak, so they were taken over by their neighbors, or they exploded, and something else came along, or they divided up. But the trend in most of the world has been, is when there's a weak state that cannot defend itself, it goes away. Since the end of World War II, and especially since the early 1960s, that has not been the case for a whole variety of reasons which I can't get into, but let's just say it's no longer acceptable in Africa or the rest of the world for a state to disappear through armed conflict. So states which are palpably weak, which Joe referred to, continue to exist even though they cannot defend their own borders or even their own territory within the state. This is historically unprecedented. There's no previous period in world history anywhere where states that were weak continue to exist. So, Africa has avoided the European disease of 1500 to 1945 of continual interstate war. African countries, by and large, don't fight each other. And they've avoided all that terrible conflict that Europe, 
and also other parts of the world when it, it went through. On the other hand, because these states have not been forged through conflict, by and large, they're weak and there is not the traditional treatment available for weak states, which is something else comes along and replaces them. So the possibility of permanent weakness is for real. And I'll just add in the prospect of foreign aid, which is specifically designed to shore up weak states, is also unprecedented in world history. In the past, strong countries tried to take over weak countries. They didn't give them foreign aid to try to persist. So that's the African security paradox at the biggest level. International peace, regional peace, countries don't by and large fight each other. Very few interstate wars, but not a mechanism to cure weak states. Now, what are the big trends in African conflict since the early 1960s when most countries received their independence? Decolonization itself was extremely peaceful in most of the continent. Indeed, African decolonization is the largest transfer of political power in world history done peacefully. And the vast majority of countries, only several dozen people died during the terminal colonial period, largely because the colonialists, exhausted, had decided to get out. The exception, of course, were the liberation struggles, largely in southern Africa, and the fight against apartheid, to the extent you consider that a colonial issue in South Africa, which were extremely violent. But in the 1960s, with some exceptions, Nigeria most notably, decolonization in the immediate aftermath was relatively peaceful. Indeed, when I started studying civil-military relations in the mid-1980s, the old uh, tenant was the one thing African militaries didn't do was fight. Uh, that they were more of a threat to their own government than anyone else. That began to change, and there was an upsurge in violence, especially as the Cold War came to an end. And there was a reshuffling of the deck, as it were, between the old patrons, the United States, the Soviet Union especially, and clients. And if you look at where big wars developed, in Ethiopia, in the Sierra Leone, Liberia complex, in Mozambique, and Zaire slash the Democratic Republic of the Congo, those conflicts came about because the former external supporter, which was propping up those regimes, left, in the case of the Soviet Union, or the United States got interested in other things, other than who was strategically valuable. And there was a big upsurge in violence, and in the 1990s, the most conflict in terms of deaths related to battle worldwide were on the African continent. In the 70s and 80s, that uh, attribution had been in Asia. Uh, but the conf locus of world conflict shifted to Africa after the end of the Cold War. But those conflicts did eventually resolve because one side or another won, like in the case of Ethiopia, or the international community was able to impose some kind of settlement, or the parties were exhausted. So by the late 1990s, Africa began to er enter into an era of quite significant stability. Now, what were the things that were propping up that stability in terms of an ending of conflicts and very slow emergence of new conflicts? Well, they're exactly the things that Joe referred to. First, the pendulum swung towards less conflict. Wars do end. Those wars ended. Pendulum swung towards more peace. Second, there was an improvement in economic growth. I can describe in about 30 seconds the continental history of economic growth in Africa, which won't pertain directly to any country, but is relevant to almost every country. From the 1960s to around 1976, most African countries grew in terms of per capita income by around, four per, by around one to two percentage points a year, which was considered inadequate at the time, but in retrospect looks pretty good. Then from 1976 to 1994, okay, 28 years, African per capita income declined. 
terrible. Commodity prices <coughs> were lower after the OPEC booms. The poor governance that Joe referred to really produced a drag on uh, economic performance. And governments had a, lar had a large amount of trouble implementing the economic reform programs proposed by the IMF and World Bank. Around 1994, continentally, and about then for most of your countries, things turned around and Africa began to grow again on a per capita basis. But it took another 10 years until 2004 to get back to where the continent had been in 1976, the previous high point of economic growth. And then between 2004 and 2015, per capita income rose every single year. Not surprisingly, during that relative period of prosperity, when growth was positive after 1994, and especially after 2004, conflict started to decline because the proverbial pie, as we'd say, in America was getting bigger. Everyone could eat a little more. And then finally, during the same period of time, partially coincidentally, partially because of good governance, democracy was improving. If you look at ratings of democracy, after 1989, after the fall of the Berlin Wall, African countries began to be get more democratic and they, began, they became progressively more democratic on a continental basis between 1989 and 2005, which appears to have been peak freedom on the African continent. And then 2005 onward, things begin to decline. But between 1994 and let's say 2015, most economies were improving and most countries were becoming more democratic and conflict was going down. So that was the period when people talked about Africa rising. What's happened since 2014, 2015, take your pick of the exact date, is conflict has begun to increase again. We saw in, 19, in 2014 the most deaths related to combat since 1999, and the trends are not good. What's happened? Well, part of it is just the natural rhythm of conflict. Conflicts ended, and then some conflicts began. The pendulum is always moving back and forth, and sometimes you're looking for causes, but sometimes it's just the rhythm of history. But also, the economics began to turn against African countries, especially as Chinese growth declined and the demand of China for so many of the commodities that Africa produces began to decline and commodity prices were lower. Since 2015, African growth on a continental basis, each individual country, it's a different story, uh, has been negative on a per capita basis. That is, adjusting for population, countries are getting poorer. And it appears that will again be the case in 2017 and 2018. So what's available in what are still very poor countries is becoming less. And also, countries are becoming less democratic. As I said, peak freedom was probably in 2005. And we've seen since then the return of many authoritarians. Joe mentioned briefly the Freedom House um, classifications, very famous, of free, partly free, not free. Only nine countries rated as free, and they've been pretty steady uh, since 2005. And the number of countries that are rated as partly free has gone down a little bit now, and once again, the not free category is the biggest category in Africa. Uh, and we've seen in a variety of ways that leaders have learned how to manipulate election processes and other uh, democratic forms so that while Africa still has the most elections of any continent in the world on a yearly basis, those elections don't necessarily promote a routine turnover of leaders and many people are increasingly skeptical of uh, how democratic their countries really are. To give you only one example, in 2016, 12 African countries interrupted their internet 
in order to deprive the opposition of the mobilization through social that social media provides. Okay, one quarter of the continent. Last year, there were deliberate government in interruptions of the internet, ranging from a few days before the election to a long period of time uh, in order to uh, defang the opposition. Uh, and that uh, indicates the complexity of the period we're in. So what I think we're seeing is the factors which underpinned the relative peace of Africa, especially in the 2000s, um, are now going against us. Countries are experiencing less economic growth, they're less free, and I think therefore they're more challenged, both in terms of arranging political compromise and in the very essence of state institutions. Now, as Joe said, most of conflict in Africa and most deaths related to battlefield are still in a relatively few countries. Nigeria, Sudan, South Sudan, Libya, Somalia, throw in Central African Republic and the Democratic Republic of Congo. I would argue that these are, by and large, battles of weakness. They are not countries, as Joe said, that are facing invasion of strong forces from the outside. They're not even facing invasions of weak forces from the outside, generally. Uh, rather, these are weak internal forces that the government nonetheless cannot put down because it lacks the resources of governance, whether it be the trust of individuals or the security organizations in the form of the police and the military, military to suppress what are in fact very weak organizations. And this again differs completely from what we've seen in the rest of the world, where countries usually face stronger neighbors as their biggest threat. African countries that are in conflict, only a minority of them, but all countries have to pay attention to these trends, by and large are facing battles of weakness. Their weak governments are facing weak internal threats, and, but they cannot defeat them. But at the same time, the internal movements cannot defeat the governments. If you look, there haven't really been many changes of regime because of the conflicts that both Joe and I have cited. Uh, the last one that I think you could really argue for was Libya, and that was largely an external uh, intervention, not because of internal disruption, although there was internal disruption. Um, these wars of weakness tend to drag on because neither side can win militarily. The government cannot defeat a reb rebels, which are almost always in rural areas, but the rural-based rural insurgents cannot get into the capital and defeat the government in any significant way. So this is an argument, I think, that state institutions have to become stronger before conflicts begin in order to have the trust of people, but also to understand what is going on in their countries and to be able to present force against in possible internal threats before the wars really get going. That the African states themselves have to be made stronger. Now, as Joe said, there's been a revolution in how Africans provide peacekeepers to other African states. Uh, we've, in good part, realized the dream of, if not African solutions to African problems, then Africa providing a good part of the solution. But these peacekeepers are facing the exact same problem that a previous generation of American European peacekeepers faced in Africa, which is peacekeepers cannot, they can potentially suppress some violence. They cannot build up state institutions themselves. And given very limited resources, either because the United States and Europe didn't want to commit much or because African countries don't have the resources to commit to peacekeeping, it's generally very difficult to impose order except in small states. If you took the, per, the peacekeepers per square kilometer 
that the international community had in Sierra Leone and tried to duplicate that in Democratic Republic of the Congo, you would need 250,000 to 300,000 troops. That's not going to happen. It's not going to happen from Africa. It's not going to happen from anywhere else. So the scourge of the big states, of big territory, is one which no one has been able to, uh, to uh, solve. So I think what we're seeing now is simply the ebb and flow of how states are created over time. And that it's hardly surprising that young states have immense security problems. No state is created and then the people are simply aligned with it. That's not how it's worked in world history. But what Africa uniquely has had to deal with is permanent weakness of some states because the old cure of someone else taking over, of becoming part of a larger state, is no longer available. And how to address potentially permanent weakness and the wars of weakness that follow is, I would argue, a fundamental security challenge that Africa will face. The other thing, and I'll conclude here, that I think as a future trend will be, when do these battles become increasingly urbanized? By and large, there's still rural conflicts, with some exceptions, as we saw tragically in Mogadishu a few days ago. Uh, but they're still in the rural areas. But as Joe said, an increasing percentage of the population is moving to the urban areas. And the cities will increasingly become points of contestation that the rural areas are now. And I think one of the big trends, I'll just leave this out here, of African security problems in the future will be the problems of security in the capital city and in major cities as opposed to the current time when much of the challenge is in the outlying rural areas. So happy to talk on this big issue for a few moments and uh, be delighted to discuss further with you. Thanks very much.